Uh, my name is Megan Lochter. I'm a program manager on the community involvement team. Uh, that means that I support our events. All right, and my name is Adam Crawford. I'm the outreach manager for Kittitas County. I also work with both our electric vehicle and renewables teams. And on a personal note, we uh, installed solar on our home back in 2018. Michael, you're on mute. And I'm Michael Peterson. I'm a program coordinator for net metering, uh, customer connected solar. I'm Dan Marshall, I'm one of the other program coordinators on Customer Connected Solar, uh, working specifically with solar and some other renewable uh, energies as well. Uh, my name is Marcus Vierta, uh, and I'm the board president for the Washington Solar Energy Industry Association, which represents uh, about 40 different uh, solar contractors, distributors, manufacturers uh, operating in Washington state. I'm Leslie. Hi there, sorry about the technical difficulties. I'm Leslie Moynihan. I'm VSE's product manager for our customer solar programs. Great. Well, thank you all for being here and um, I'll hand it over to Adam. All right, so here at PSC, safety is of the utmost importance. And so we always like to start our gatherings with a safety moment. This one is five fall tips. So on foggy mornings, when you are uh, driving from, from place to place, make sure to slow down and allow extra time. Uh, when you are driving in the fog, you wanna make sure that your uh, lights are on and you are driving for conditions. Uh, also note that you don't want to use your high beams because that can uh, cause issues with uh, when you're driving. Uh, fall on leaves on sidewalks, so you want to make sure and clear your sidewalks and your storm drains. Uh, it can be hazardous if you're walking on uh, wet leaves. Fire safety, check batteries and smoke detectors and your CO2 alarms. Uh, we recommend doing that about every six months, but you definitely wanna do it on an annual basis. Uh, also with the CO2 alarms, uh, they do have a useful life of about seven or five to seven years. And so uh, if you haven't changed those out, you might wanna take a look at that. Flu season is here. Uh, let's take what we learned over the last two and a half years and put that towards this year's flu season. And finally, uh, it's time for your annual service on your furnace. And so if you can't remember the last time that you had your furnace uh, serviced, you definitely want to get that on the schedule. All right, we'll move on to our next slide. Uh, and this is my favorite. So for everybody attending today, you've automatically been entered into winning one of two prizes. And so those prizes consist of a solar tailgate kit, uh, which includes a solar powered generator, a radio and helmet string lights. So those two winners will uh, be notified later today uh, if you are a winner. So good luck to everybody on this webinar. Move on to our poll. And so you will see a poll that pops up. Uh, go ahead and fill that out. The question is, how long have you been thinking about solar for your home? Is it just starting to think about it over the last year? Maybe it's been a few years or longer than that, but the timing's just never been right. Uh, if it's something that you don't see on here, go ahead and put that in the chat. I'm going to go ahead and pose this question to Marcuse. How long have you been thinking about solar for your home? Yeah, so I was thinking about have, owning solar uh, since 2010 when I first got into the solar industry, and it took me seven years <laughs> to buy a house. And so I installed solar the first week I owned my house in 2017, um, and I actually expanded my system in 2020 um, to give me more generating capacity to help um, offset the usage that was added when I got an electric car. So uh, I've had solar for, yeah, for a little while now. <laughs> Very good. 
All right. Um, poll has closed, and it looks like coming in first at uh, 35% is number three over the last few years, and coming in second is more than two years, but the, not, the time has not been right. Um, I know from personal experience, we looked at solar uh, for a number of years, maybe close to five, and then actually really looked hard into it for about a year. And so uh, thanks, everybody, for participating in that poll. Uh, from here, I'm going to hand it off to Michael. There we go. Thank you, Adam. Uh, uh, thank, uh, and so what is customer connected solar? Um, you know, it is when customers generate their own renewable energy uh, so they can uh, not only reduce their carbon footprint, but also help lower their electricity bills. Um, that is usually the main point there where customers are just looking to get a lower electric bill. And um, we offer, you know, information to help uh, get you started on that process. And if, if we go to the next slide, we'll take a look at the actual uh, rate that we've had uh, customers actually getting solar put in. So right now we are just a little over 15,000 customers that are interconnected to our grid uh, with some renewable uh, energy. Uh, there, whether it be solar, um, there's customers that have wind and also hydro. And if you take a look here in the growth um, since 2018, you can just see uh, the fact of how much uh, growth we're getting per year um, in that in this graph here. Um, so now is a perfect time to be thinking about going solar and getting yourself. Uh, uh, set up for it as um, a lot of uh, customers around the region are actually going ahead and getting that put in here. And if we can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So, uh, you know, we talked about the fact of lowering your bill. So how does that happen? So here is um, a brief overview of how net metering works and how you're actually generating your um, electricity there. So the first thing we have is uh, we have the sun, which is gonna go ahead and uh, generate uh, power through the uh, solar panels that you have. The solar panels will provide electricity in the DC form, and that's gonna go to a inverter. That inverter, is going to change the uh, electrical current from DC to AC, which is what you use in your home every day. And so with that AC that you are producing is gonna go to your home and your home is gonna self consume that energy uh, or electricity first. And as your, uh, anything that goes over what your home needs at that current time is going to go back to your electrical meter. That meter is going to be a two-way meter, a bi-directional. So you are able to take that energy that you overproduced than what you needed at that particular time and send it back to PSE's grid. And that meter will keep track of how much energy that you use or that you send back to the grid so that you can bank that to use it at a later time because you're still going to need power coming from PSE's grid into your home for the times that you don't produce as much as what you need. Uh, usually you'll see that uh, during obviously the nighttime or uh, in the shorter and cloudier days that uh, come during winter time. Although you still will produce some during the winter time, um, but it may not be enough to take care of all your needs. So it is a now a instead of just being a one way communication where the house is always just taking energy from the grid. It is now a two way communication to where not only you take an energy from the grid, but you're also sending energy back to the grid that you'll be able to use at a later time. And now I will send it over to my colleague, Dan, who will 
uh, get more into how the actual, uh, what you're going to do to get yourself hooked up with solar. Thank you, Michael. Um, I really appreciate seeing that graph of just the solar growth. Um, that's, that's solar growth um, and PSC territory, which just shows how quickly it's growing, um, just how much interest there is today um, as well. Uh, so for those of you, I see a lot of great questions coming through, um, but th for those of you, you know, there's a, there's a wide range of different um, steps where people are at. So um, understanding what Michael is saying about how solar works, the next step, if you're thinking about solar and it's right for you, is to kind of do some more research. And we always recommend a good starting point to do this research is going to psc.com. Uh, slash net metering or customer connected solar. Both of them will bring you to our webpage that talks a little bit more about some of the steps and some of the things to think about um, and questions to ask as well. Um, so we always recommend starting there and that'll walk you through some of the steps on what it takes to actually get solar up and running um, and maybe some resources as well. Um, one of those resources on that page is our recommended energy professionals, or you can go to psc.com slash REP. And that will lead you to, if you're logged into your account, that will lead you to the ability to actually request some um, referrals to different installers that we recommend. Um, the good thing about our recommended energy professionals is those are all vetted solar installers who, who know what they're doing, they've been in the business. Um, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of good installers that may not be on that list as well, uh, but these ones for sure know what they're doing uh, versus maybe a roofer or somebody who's just getting in the industry that maybe is not as well versed. So it's, it's really recommended to go to net metering and then check out or request a list of those recommended energy professionals. Uh, so that way you can uh, start off on the right foot um, and work from there. So we'll talk about this a bit more on the next slide, but. Um, Essentially, what's going to happen to get the list of those installers and what we're going to recommend is out of that list of installers or if you go on Google or no matter how you find your, your installers via website, phone call, friend, get multiple bids. Um, we really recommend getting three bids at minimum. Uh, if you get more, no harm in that um, because there is a wide variety of what different installers may be offering you, whether it's financing. Uh, making model solar panels and, and just multiple things that might uh, differ from your home, from your neighbor's home. Um, and those installers will kind of ask you those questions and help you along with that process, which is really great. Um, you know, aside from getting multiple bids, um, I want to talk just briefly and really high level on what you can expect when you're working with an installer. Um, you know, I see some questions coming through about cost and stuff like that. And you know, the cost will vary. But again, solar installers will take a look at your roof, determine if your roof is in good condition, determine if its orientation is well suited for solar, or maybe you have trees um, or something else that might not uh, make it a good candidate. So those, those installers will typically do all this work for you and look at this um, in a bigger picture to see what you can expect for your solar output or what system size you might need and kind of walk you through the more complex questions. Um, so I know a lot of these questions you have today are probably around the complexity of that. Um, but again, talking to three or four installers will help you figure out um, if your roof space is good, if maybe a ground mount system or some other type of system might work better for you. Um, or if maybe just there's some other alternative if that solar doesn't work for you. Um, so that's kind of where we're at on the, on the solar spectrum there. You know, as far as timelines go from the utility perspective, I wanna talk about that briefly as well. Um, you know, our role as a utility is to help you interconnect with solar. We're not selling you solar directly or anything like that, um, but we do work with a lot of these solar installers um, to make this as efficient as possible. So when you are working with solar installers, it may take a month, it may take two months, it could take a little bit longer. It really depends on their schedule. And I know solar installers are booked out several months possibly. Um, and then how quickly they can work with us to um, get through the paperwork and the process that we need to do to verify that the system is safe to operate on our grid. Uh, but I would expect a few months at minimum once they actually get through the starting process of installing solar. Um, but again, our role here is just to make sure that your system is going to be safe to the grid um, and your installer is going to really make sure that your system is built properly for both 
the grid, as well as LNI or other electrical codes that come into play. Um, so I'll leave it at that for, for that discussion. Um, we can certainly talk more at, at the Q&A if there's other questions, um, but I wanna pass it off now. Um, and, and I think we're doing another poll and then we'll hear from Marcus after that. Great. Thanks, Dan and Michael. Lots of good information. All right, second and final poll. What is most influencing your consideration of solar? Is it reducing your carbon footprint and climate impact, the financial investment, new and exciting technology, energy independence and power security, or is it something else? So if it is something else, go ahead and put that to the chat. Uh, I am going to pose this question to Michael. What is most influencing your consideration of solar? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Uh, for me personally, it is definitely the financial investment uh, that is going to, uh, that I'm going to have to really think about here um, as far as getting solar uh, put onto my place. Because um, because it is a, it, it is a, it's a lifetime investment. It, it just isn't something where you're going to see, you know, uh, a rate of return uh, instantly. You know, this is going to take, uh, you know, a couple of decades before you uh, could start seeing that rate of return uh, to where you are, you know, definitely uh, getting yourself into the green and, and making it a wise investment. But, you know, I definitely see the fact that, you know, there is, you know, many customers that are getting this on. So, you know, that is, uh, and also weighing on my mind as well is just the fact of how many roofs, especially new ones being built, are getting solar panels. So, yeah, absolutely. Great. Thanks for that. Um, we have closed our poll. Coming in at number one was reducing your carbon footprint and climate impact, followed by uh, the financial investment at 31%. So, thanks again to everybody that was participating in that poll. We appreciate it. And now I want to hand it off to Mark Hoos. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Adam, and, uh, and, and everyone who's presented so far. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, I know, as, as, as you know, the folks before me had mentioned, the industry is growing really quickly right now. Um, there's a lot of adoption happening um, in Washington State Solar, which is fantastic. And what I wanted to help kind of lend a little bit of insight in is kind of how to go about procuring solar for your home or business um, uh, and by following some best practices. So um, again, I'm, I'm Mark Virta. I am the president of the Washington Solar Energy Industry Association. Um, I've been in the industry now for about 12 years. Um, and yeah, we're seeing the highest adoption rates of solar right now than we've seen in that that period. Part of it has to do with the Inflation Reduction Act and um, what passed last month with kind of renewal of the investment tax credit, which is that um, the solar incentive for homeowners and business owners uh, on their taxes. Um, so when it comes to getting a bid for solar, and I absolutely echo uh, PSE's comments that the best thing you can do is get multiple bids. That's always number one. This is a professional service. Um, and we want to make sure we're getting a, a diversity of thoughts and opinions because it is a big investment. Um, so starting at PSE is a great place to start. Get an idea of, of you know, reputable contractors in your service area and um, and how many you know projects potentially they've been they've been doing when they've started as a business. All of that. Um, number two, once you've solicited those bids, make sure you're talking to a system designer at that company, uh, not necessarily just a salesperson, but make sure the person you're talking to understands and owns the, the you know, electrical and structural design of the project. Um, and, and try to ask them you know, those, those important questions that I'm seeing in the chat that are really great. How are we interconnecting to the roof? How are you verifying that the roof won't leak? How is the electrical interconnection happening? And you know, how do you verify and warranty that interconnection? Um, what's the warranty on the equipment, et cetera? Uh, that's my third tip is understand the equipment that's being proposed. Make sure you know there's a serial number, um, there's a make and model of the panel, the inverter, the racking system, and understand the warranties that are attached to all of those. There's, you know, a, a huge market. There's a lot of diversity in product out there. 
and and really making sure you understand what you're purchasing before you dive into it is is going to be important um, long term. Um, and then uh, the financial case, I, I agree with Michael. Uh, a lot of people, you know, are really motivated by climate. They're motivated by decarbonization, uh, but the the finances still need to, they matter. <laughs> Um, so really, in order to understand the financial circumstance of solar at your home or business, you're going to need an on-site assessment, and you're going to need to know really what the solar resources is for specifically for you. Um, that, that can vary a lot. So you really want to know that the installers that you're getting bids from are doing those on-site assessments. They're really understanding holistically the total cost of the project. They're identifying any potential change orders, um, and you have a really clear idea of you know, the costs, liabilities, and then warranties of the project. Um, five is uh, get examples of their work. Talk to references. Talk to folks who've worked with the installer. Check their reviews on, you know, solarreviews.com or Energy Sage or even Google. Um, and, and understand that, you know, there's a lot of volume happening. And so ask the question, too, is, you know, how long have you specifically been at the company? Um, how much turnover is there within your workforce? Those types of questions are really, really valuable and important to ask. And then the last, last tip I would give is sleep on it. Never get, you know, pressured into making a big decision like this. Take your time uh, and really be thoughtful about, um, you know, about the realisticness of this project, how long you're going to be in your home, how long you'll have the business, um, and, and what the timeline is on cost recovery, et cetera. Um, so that's, that's what I would recommend, um, is make sure you're talking to an expert, make sure you're, you're taking your time with the decision. Oh. Yeah, and, and I will pass it back to the PSE team. All right, thank you, Marcus. Um, what Marcus says rings uh, pretty true. So part of my job is I work with customers a lot who are asking questions about interconnection on projects that are in process. And there's a wide range of questions, um, but there are certainly a lot of customers who um, didn't sleep on it and they made quick decisions. And, um, and we hear a lot of questions because they didn't talk to their installer first. So that's a really great recommendation. It's Get those questions answered from your installer to kind of verify that they know what they're doing. Uh, so I really appreciate that. Um, so the other thing I want to talk about here briefly is if for some reason you talk to those installers and you determine that solar is just not right for you, um, you know, whether again it's the shading, the, the cost, whatever the reason is, there, there's several reasons. Um, PSE has other options. We have other things available for customers who want to be green. I think on that last poll, uh, the number one answer was really to reduce your carbon footprint, um, second by financial incentive or financial benefit. Um, so we have several products. And I won't go into them in any detail here, but uh, again, on our website, there is uh, a couple of pages that talk about different programs. So I'll just mention really quick the other renewable programs that we have. Um, and there's a couple of them. Uh, let me pull them up here really quick. So we have uh, what we call green power. We have solar choice carbon balance, and those programs help us um, to really just match how much energy you use with green power renewable energy. Um, we have community solar programs. We have renewable natural gas. If you're both a gas and electric com uh, customer and you want to replace your gas usage as well. Um, and then of course we talked about customer connected solar. Um, out of all those programs, I just want to talk a little bit more about one program. If you want to go to the next slide. And uh, one of our newer programs is Community Solar. Um, this was launched recently, and it's really a great alternative if you can't install solar on your own home, but you still want to be green. You can subscribe to our Community Solar program, which allows you to offset 100%. Or, well, depending on how many shares you buy, you can, you can certainly offset 100% of your usage or more. Um, through our community solar program. And you're basically, you're subscribing to a monthly charge instead of spending several thousand dollars up front, you're paying a monthly fee uh, on your bill, which helps you go with green power. And I see some people tend to have green power, they have community solar, um, they have some of these programs. So I'm seeing a lot of positive comments on that. 
Um, but I just want to make sure that you guys are aware that there are alternative options if solar does not uh, pan out for you. Um, look at these options, visit our website, and learn a, bit, a little bit more about these options as well. Um, so that, that's all I wanted to say about the other programs uh, for this portion. Um, I'll, well, I guess I'll just say, if you have questions, certainly here's the link to our main website, uh, psc.com slash net metering for our solar program, for what we call net metering, the customer connected solar. I see a link posted, uh, psc.com slash renewables, uh, which will take you to the main webpage that talks about both our solar program, as well as our other alternative renewable programs. Um, and I guess I'll pass it back on to Adam. Yes, and um, I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Leslie as we get into our question and answer um, portion of this webinar. All right, thanks, Michael. Dan, I think you have done a great job and already answered some of the questions, but um, appreciate everybody's questions coming in. Reminder, um, we're having a hard time navigating. Please don't use the chat if you have a question that you'd like to get answered. Um, the Q&A box is the way to go. Um, there are a few themes that we've seen. So first off, I'm going to answer one real quick that's come in a couple of times um, about what if I have a different electric utility than PSE? PSE has a large service area. We serve customers with natural gas in a lot of areas that have other electric providers, Seattle City Lights, Snohomish PUD, Peninsula Light, et cetera. Um, so some of the things that uh, Dan and Michael and others presented here um, will apply, but we are not able to speak for all utilities. Um, net metering and interconnection, those are concepts that are addressed um, as a state. Um, but each utility has their own processes um, and standards and requirements. So certainly encourage you to check directly with your electric utility on interconnection. Um, depending on where you live as well, they may have other local installers that they recommend. Uh, but everything that uh, Marcus shared about, you know, being an informed uh, customer, uh, obviously that's really great info regardless of where you live and who your utility provider is. Um, next question is, um, what about incentives, financial incentives, tax credits, state incentives available for solar? Uh, who wants to take that one? Marcus, you want to take that one? You bet. Um, yeah, so that's going to be part of the product offering or the the consultancy that your your solar installer that you're getting bids from should be able to help you with. Um, you know, each like Leslie mentioned, each utility is going to have kind of a different way of of addressing that metering, and it's important that the solar installer, when they're basing the financial calculations, um, that are all derived by that on-site assessment and that solar assessment are based in, in reality, that they're not using kind of unrealistic expectations for the cost of electricity, inflation, and whatnot. Um, but I can tell you the basics. So Washington State has a sales tax exemption for solar installations uh, at the 100 kilowatt AC system size, which is like three to 400 panels. It's larger than anyone would need on their home uh, and smaller. So pretty much any residential system in Washington State should be fully sales tax exempt. And then the Re Inflation Reduction Act um, has incentives uh, and extensions to incentives for solar. So by no means am I or anyone on this call a tax <laughs> advisor or attorney. Um, definitely, that's another kind of point I'd recommend is make sure you have a CPA look over um, any proposal that's 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 given to you and, and vetted so that you know they can take a really close look at your tax situation and, and verify that all those assumptions are correct. But there is a 30% uh, investment tax credit for solar that's extended for 10 years. So we've got the longest runway we've ever had in the solar industry right now for that incentive. And then that metering, like like Leslie had mentioned. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Um, and that goes into the next question, which is, you know, can we provide a general idea of a cost range or payback of a solar system? 
Um, all right, I'm going to take that one. Uh, um, I would say that, you know, we, we haven't specifically mentioned cost because there are so many, it depends on your situation. So this, and this actually leads into another question of what determines the cost, right? So the size of the system, how much energy you want it to produce over time are going to have big impact on the cost of your system. Um, but other aspects of your unique installation at your unique site um, will have impacts on the cost and, of course, what types of equipment you want to purchase, as Mark was kind of touched on. There's a lot of different products out there available. Um, but I think it is reasonable to say that this is not a real quick um, investment that you're going to make tons of money right away. Um, solar systems, if you were to pay up front down payment, you know, cash right now would, I would say would be reasonable payback period, certainly in the 12 to longer year range, um, maybe 10 year range, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect a, a payback shorter than that. And then there are ways to incorporate some really good financing options so that you can manage that in a different way rather than spending it all up front. Um, there hey, is a Leslie. question. Yeah. Yeah, I'll just jump in as, as a solar homeowner. Um, when we went out for our bid, we actually received uh, from one company three different bids based on the size of that site, the different inverters that could be used, and also uh, south facing versus south and east facing. And so we actually went through all those numbers and determined what was best for us at that time, looking at payback and where we actually wanted those panels on our roof. So definitely uh, recommend uh, doing that if you can. Yeah, that's a really awesome example, Adam. And I think also when talking to multiple installers, um, the more you can kind of talk ahead of time about what your goals are, how much energy you want to be able to offset, what your limiting factor is, whether that's budget or your roof space, um, the more you can provide in terms of your goals up front, the more you'll be able to get sort of an apples to apples bid to compare, right? So installers can kind of tailor their bid to what they think they're hearing you would like, and then you can look at what are the different costs between those different bids. I think that's a really, really smart approach. Um, and again, as Mark Hughes mentioned, um, you do want to have a, um, an idea of how much energy it will produce per that cost. You don't just want to compare upfront cost to upfront cost because they may be for systems that produce a very different amount of energy. And you should expect that that should be based on a site analysis with, with solar assessment tools to really look at what, what can work for your home. Like that, Leslie, I just wanna add, you know, I think that that should be clarified as well. You know, financial incentives is one thing, but also if an installer goes out to your house and says, I, just, I can fit 40 panels in your roof, doesn't matter that you need 40 panels without really understanding your electric usage or if you have, you know, five people at home versus two people, um, you know, that, that's kind of a red flag there of saying, hey, wait a minute, you know, I, I need you as an installer to help me understand my payback, but also tell me like, how much is this going to offset of my electric bill, you estimate per year, or per month, or however they want to break it down. Um, and that's not usually a question people think to ask at first, but it, it's kind of something that really tells you if you're working with an installer that really is thinking of like your best interest of how much payback is, but also what does your home need um, versus how much can we just fit on your roof? Absolutely. Yeah, great point. Uh, back to that poll question of how long have you been considering solar? Um, you know, I had a, a couple of solar installers out to do an assessment at my house many years ago. Um, and the I have very low electricity use. Um, I've done tons of energy efficiency and I have gas heat and gas appliances. Um, and I have a neighbor to my south with a really beautiful big Douglas fir tree, right? So combined with small electric use and not um, a great roof space with solar access meant that the numbers I would look at were just not very cost effective. I made the decision that solar just wasn't the right fit for the house I'm in right now. 
Um, and that's okay. That's why I joined Community Solar and other green power programs. All right, next question we're going to talk about is um, batteries. We, we haven't really talked about batteries, but there are several folks who have asked about having backup power, um, wanting batteries with a solar array. We've got specific questions mentioning Tesla product and that they've heard a lot of excitement about uh, Tesla roofs and power walls. So I was wondering if, Marcus, you could help us out with um, just a little bit of uh, what does it mean to install solar with battery backup? Is it necessary? And if you choose that, um, does it change the process with your utility interconnection? Yeah, great questions. And, and one I think we get on every single request for a bid. <laughs> so so keep that going and, and definitely be asking these questions as you're, you're soliciting bids from installers. Um, that no battery systems aren't required. Uh, in order to install solar. Um, yes, battery systems are typically required if you want to have backup power in the event of a storm and a grid outage. Um, I think, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, Leslie, I think the average PSE customer is only losing power about six to seven hours a year. So we've got a very reliable grid and obviously it depends on where you are. Um, but folks, folks ask all the time, what about batteries? Uh, what about costs of batteries? And they really range. Um, similar to, to the points that were being made earlier, when you're comparing apples and oranges and quotes from different solar installers for solar, you want to try to normalize the, the, the costs in front of you. And you can do that by taking the cost and dividing it by the rated capacity of the system, which is the wattage of the system. So that'll allow you to kind of understand what the difference is in installer quotes and the cost per watt installed. Um, and you can do that with battery systems as well. Understand what the cost per kilowatt hour of application is. And then it's, you know, it's a, a decision that um, you'll have to do your own research on. There's a whole bunch of different battery chemistries are out there. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different applications, ways to apply the battery. You can have a whole home battery backup system. You could have a partial, just critical load battery backup system. Uh, and the, the really important thing to recognize is certainly in Western Washington, we have really pretty limited solar generating capacity in winter months. So, you know, installing a battery that could cost twenty to thirty thousand dollars on your home for that, you know, three or four hours a year that you lose power may not be the best fit <laughs> in your budget. But certainly any solar contractor should should have a, you know, an idea of what battery systems cost, the value of them, and they can help walk you through options specifically for you. And like Leslie had mentioned, really defining your goals on the front end so that you can go in and really um, help educate the installer on why you're asking these questions, and then they can give you an honest response. And th that's a good point, Marcus, um, when you, when, when I, when I am looking at customers that are getting battery systems and answering direct questions, um, it's always interesting about the fact that they think by having a battery system that they're going to not lose power. And that very well may be true. And uh, except for the fact, if you happen to be in an area where storms are prevalent and you know we may get something that lasts you know, two days or something like that, your battery system may not be able to actually stay charged to run your actual uh, electrical needs uh, during that time because once the power goes out, your solar no longer produces. So um, you know there, I know there is uh, there is ways to still get the solar to charge the batteries. Um, you know there there is uh, newer options coming out that do allow that, but um, you know that's something that is obviously going to cost you more as well. So um, be thinking about that aspect as well of the fact that you know the if you are in a storm and it is a little bit longer that that battery may not last for your full needs i think i think yeah so so pretty much all of the battery systems that are out there are able to be charged with solar when they're when they're installed in tandem together during an outage but the important thing is you know how much resource is there in a grid outage you know uh in you know rainy cloudy <laughs> windy december months um so that, that's important. But, uh, you know, the other thing is there's a lot, a lot, a lot of research and development going into the battery storage industry right now. 
So, you know, absolutely you can, you can spend the money and do it now, um, but you want to also be thoughtful and think about where, where we're at on the battery, the home battery system learning curve. Um, and, and, and certainly, you know, the incentives that are available for battery systems may be catching up <laughs> as well as the technology. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're thinking about solar because we're thinking about doing the right thing about decarbonizing our fuel mix. And that's great. Um, we also, we, we really need to consider, you know, the, the flexibility and autonomy these systems can afford both ourselves and the larger grid. So, you know, as we look down the road, there's going to be more application of, of remote storage onto the grid to create nodes of control and flexibility. But, um, but we're, we're working really hard to build that. And, you know, it's, uh, it's still ex expensive technology at the end of the day. Absolutely. Thanks to you both. Um, I think we do have a bunch of uh, more specific battery questions in the Q&A. So um, I'm just going to say for those, um, we will likely um, also be able to reply to you directly. If we don't get to your question, um, we'll reply through email. Um, if your question is a bit more specific, um, we'll be we can reply directly just to you. Um, the next one I want to talk about is um, I'm going to throw this one to Adam. Um, what has your experience as a solar homeowner been like in terms of any maintenance, cleaning, and repairs that you've had to do to keep up your system? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So uh, I am located out in Ellensburg, so the weather's a little bit different than it is over on the west side. Um, but the most maintenance that we've had to do is uh, every time we get a decent amount of snow, we'll have to go up on the roof and clear that off. Luckily, it's only a one-story house, and so uh, there's not a lot of fall risk for that. And then my wife, Andrea, she actually gets up there uh, once a year and we bought a, one of those squeegee pads on a very long uh, pole and we're able to clean those panels once a year. Uh, that's it for maintenance. We haven't had to do anything else. Uh, we haven't had any issues with those solar panels or the inverter. And so um, nothing more than taking a look when we get home, seeing if those uh, those panels need to be washed every once in a while. That's great. And for those that have um, taller roofs that we wouldn't necessarily want you to risk your, your neck for, um, uh, and especially on the west side, um, typically, you know, a good hard rain will help keep those panels pretty clear, but we do have folks who get leaves, pollen, um, bird poop, things like that can actually accumulate. And over time, you can see a slow degradation to the output if your panels are really dirty. Um, but you can do the squeegee on a long pole approach um, or a, a hose. Um, always turn the panels off first. Um, and also even just a simple uh, window washer is probably the go-to if you're not able to take care of that yourself. Some of the solar installers also include optional maintenance packages for things like annual uh, washing and maintenance and checks. So thank you. Um, all right. Uh, next question is, uh, we've got a bunch of questions um, sort of around how do you know how much energy the solar panels will produce? What are the um, impacts of cloudy days? Uh, we touched on different, you know, there's different climate in Ellensburg versus Kirkland, uh, Washington, right? So um, what is the impact on shorter days, cloudy days, um, and, and some shade? Um, is it something that if you, um, you know, don't live out in Ellensburg, it's not worth it? Uh, Dan, how about you? Want to take this one? Uh, I mean, I don't want to say it's a tough question. I mean, I, I, obviously it's worth it. Um, in general, solar is worth it. The graph that we had shown earlier shows how quickly adoption is growing. I think Marcus had indicated um, they're busier now than ever um, in the industry. In Eastern Washington, Western Washington, um, you might have longer days and whatnot on, on one side of the mountain versus the other. Um, but I mean, really, all I can say is 
uh, for the last, I don't know, six or seven years that I've been uh, dealing with solar. Um, every interaction I've had with the customers and every piece of data I've seen um, is showing like most, some customers that um, have issues with their system, you know, identify there's an issue because it's not outputting, but a lot of customers are offsetting their annual usage through their solar panels on the roof. So it's, you know, in Washington, both sides of the mountains. Marcus, I see you had your hand up if you want to add to that. Yeah, um, it's great. And I, I just wanted to add a couple of things. Most of the systems that are being installed today come with a, a monitoring system that, that interconnects with your, you know, your home or business's Wi-Fi. So you're able to actually see the system's performance, um, both in real time and historic. So you're able to get kind of a gauge on how much energy the system generates and how much it should be generating. Um, it's important to clean the panels um, once every couple of years often is enough, but again, it really depends. And then as far as generation between, you know, east facing roofs or south facing roofs on cloudy days versus sunny days, the, the good news is there's a lot of really, really good data out there that helps to be the feedstock of these financial calculations that, that a solar installer will provide to determine whether the, the project's worth it. So it's a really important question to ask your installers. How is this estimate bankable? What measures have you done to verify these system performance expectations? How are you, you know, verifying your expectations to actual performance? And they should have a really thoughtful answer to that question. Uh, it's, it's a really important one to ask. Um, and yeah, you, you do see deviation. You see variance based on, you know, how much solar resource there is day to day, east, south, west facing roofs, how warm the panels get. And there's there's calculations and DRX that are really thoughtful that go into these these estimates. So absolutely keep asking those questions. Marcus, and, and Marcus, you know, go ahead, Michael. Oh, I'm sorry. And Marcus, when the installer is given the bid, are they showing the customer the uh, data sheet of the panels to to show uh, the expectancy? Anyone who's a member of Wasia is doing that. <laughs> and that's gotcha. maybe one thing I would add is members of Wasia, uh, the Washington Solar Energy Industry Association, have an additional step um, in an ethics agreement that we agree to. That means we're you know, providing the best um, information and we're providing complete information. So yeah, it's a huge red flag. If they're not giving you a cut sheet of the equipment and they're saying, we're just gonna put a solar panel on your roof and we won't tell you which one it is, um, that's a red flag and, and make sure you're getting a bid from someone else. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, I'm gonna move on to the topic of roofs in general. And specifically, uh, we've got questions about, do I need to put solar panels on my roof if I have additional uh, space on my property? So I'll just say the answer is no there. There are plenty of, uh, ground mounted solar arrays. Um, the permitting of those could be somewhat different because it is structural. So you would need to check with, you know, your city um, or permitting building permit kind of jurisdiction. Um, but uh, solar panels do not have to go on the roof. Um, but then lots of questions about folks wanting to know, um, you know, what kind of mounting is done on a roof. Do you have to have holes put in your roof? Can it damage your roof? Um, do I need to replace my roof first um, and get a roof with a new roof with my solar panel? Um, is that, Marcus, is that something you are comfortable talking about a bit? Definitely. Yeah, it's, again, you guys are already such educated consumers. It's, it's really great to see. So, so keep asking these questions. And, and, Every solar contractor out there is going to have a different different methodology of how they attach to your roof, um, how they mount onto your roof, or how they use a ground mounted structure. So understanding the differences between installers is going to be important in determining, you know, how to move forward. Um, the, you know, I'm a strong believer personally um, that you know my day job is managing a solar contractor. And I really believe that we should be flashing any roof penetration in, in Western Washington. <laughs> and I don't think it's that controversial of a thing to believe. Um, so understanding how you're flashing that roof, how the, the, the roof penetration is attaching is important. The other thing you know, that Leslie had alluded to is you know, a ground mounted system, 
you know, it's not going on the roof, but we're having to build a structure. So there's, you know, permitting, um, you know, potentially critical wetland assessments, um, you know, a bunch of steel, a bunch of concrete, and then all the labor that goes to building that structure. So there's a difference in, in the cost benefit analysis that you want to understand. Um, but yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, for flat roofs, there's ballasted non-penetrating systems, et cetera. So, so yeah, you, you know, that's really why you can't just say like, I need a 20 panel system because that's what my neighbor got. It all is customized. And that's why you want to speak with a designer and speak with multiple companies to really understand their approach and their thoughts to all of those things. Great. Um, Leslie, it looks like we have time for one more question. All right. Um, we've got a lot of good questions, but I think we've touched on most of them actually. Um, I guess I'm gonna go with one last question is, um, can you all talk real briefly about the time it takes from the beginning of a process contracting with an installer to having that system up and running? Um, actually, I'd love to start with somebody from PSE first on, on like what our process looks like. Sure, Leslie. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll let Mark, Marcus talk about um, how long the actual bid process goes and, and to actually get it installed. But as far as uh, the interconnection application process with PSC, um, you know, we're going to get the application from your installer. Um, within uh, 10 business days, we're going to have that reviewed and, um, and hopefully approved or we're going to get back with the installer to ask for some corrections uh, to be made. Uh, then once we give the approval for it to be built, uh, we're then waiting for the installer to provide us with the uh, completed and finalized permit information so that we can then go ahead and order, uh, place an order to commission uh, the system. Uh, once we get that permit information in, one to two business days, we're going to have an order written. Um, here. And then um, we, right now, because we do have so many customers that are uh, interconnecting to our grid, it is taking us um, about a month um, at the at the long end for the commissioning to actually happen. Um, so I would say probably within two to four weeks is when you would expect to realistically be interconnected with our grid and actually producing your uh, producing your own power. Um, and then I'll just go ahead and throw it to Marcus to go ahead and talk about real quick about the uh, actual bid process, how long that takes. Yeah, super quick. Um, I, I, I think I could say this on behalf of PSC too. We're all really busy right now. So a little patience would be super, like, very much appreciated. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, being okay um, with a little bit longer of a lead time may get you a better deal and better service in the end. Um, all, all of our members at Wasia are running really long, the longest lead times we've ever ran. You know, at the moment, um, it could take me a couple of weeks just to schedule the on-site assessment and get out there to look at the project, and then maybe a week or so to turn a bid around. So from when you call, it could be two or three weeks before you get a bid, um, and then it could be as long as six or seven months before we can actually build that project. Um, so, you know, it is a long lead time right now. We're ramping up. Um, I, I saw some really good information out there that says if you want to you know, do something for the climate, become an electrician, and we agree there's great jobs at PSC and in the solar industry doing that. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> that sounds great. Thank you both. Um, thanks, everybody, for great um, Q&A. Great uh, questions from our audience. Really appreciate that. Agreed. Uh, thank you. Everyone, and so grateful for our panel. Thank you for being here today. Um, for attending today, our attendees have been entered to win our solar tailgating kit. So we will actually email you today if you're one of those lucky winners. We have two winners. Um, and then we will have a survey as soon as today's event ends, and we would love to hear feedback from you. Um, if you have any questions that we didn't get to answer live, we will be following up with you in the next, probably over the next few days. Um, 
And yeah, everybody, thank you again so much for joining us. If you have questions we didn't answer, um, you can uh, put those into the survey. And um, other than that, I hope everyone gets, has a wonderful rest of your day and uh, appreciate you being here. Take care. Thanks everyone.